This Week in Virology, the podcast about viruses, the kind that make you sick. This Week in Virology, episode number 148, recorded on September 9th, 2011. Hi, everybody. I'm Vincent Racaniello, and this is TWIV, the podcast all about viruses. Today we have another special episode. We're recording TWIV in Exeter, New Hampshire, and we are at the virology retreat of Harvard Medical School. And what better place to record a TWIV in front of a room full of virologists? And so we've been able to select from all the virologists here, the guests joining me today. And in fact, this, retreat, this is a retreat, and I'll have one of our guests explain that to you in a moment. This is a virology retreat, and it's been organized by the graduate students uh, in the virology program at Harvard. And they have also selected all the speakers, all the guests in TWIV. They've also selected me to come here as well. So my guests today on my left, a, a graduate student in uh, the virology program here at Harvard, Philip Kranzus. Is that yeah, right? It's pretty good. Yeah. <laughs> well, how, how would you say it? I would say Cranchess, but. Cranchess, okay. Cranchess. Well, you know, my name is a twister, too, so I'm used to getting it wrong. But you're a, a G5? I'm a fifth year student in Sean Whelan's lab. So we have the novel way of labeling students here with a G, which means graduate, graduate, right? Or hope to graduate. Hope to graduate. <laughs> <laughs> and then the, the year. Well, that's good. So you're a G5 here in the, in the virology program. So thanks for joining us. Welcome to TWIB. Thank you for having me. And I'm going to call you Philip from now on. Next to Philip, on Philip's left, is a professor in, uh, the, in the Department of Microbiology and Immunobiology. He's also part of the virology program, hence being at the virology retreat. Someone I've known for many years, David Knight. Welcome. Hi, Vincent. How are you doing? Good. It's good, to, it's good to be here. It's good to uh, have you here at our retreat. Thank you. We're going to talk about each one of these guests where they came from, what they're doing in a moment. And finally, all the way on the left there, another professor in the department. Are you in the same department as uh, microbiology and immunobiology? Yes, I am. Also in the virology program, Priscilla Yang. Welcome to TWIV. Thank you. Thanks for joining us. Uh, so we thought we would talk about where these investigators came from, what they do, give you a sense of what we do on This Week in Virology every week. And then if we have time, we'll do a usual show. We'll do some emails. We get lots of emails from listeners of this program, and we answer them on every show. And then at the end, we do what we call our science picks of the week, where we pick each of the guests on the show, pick something scientific that they like to recommend uh, to the audience. And perhaps some of you have prepared a science pick of the week. But if you haven't, you have an hour to think about it. <laughs> Somebody get my laptop. <laughs> yeah, yeah. If someone in her lab can give her one, yeah. you could come up here. So also, we do have an audience, um, and you're welcome to ask questions. We do have a, a microphone here, right? Is this a wireless mic working? So you know, if something comes up and you'd like to be immortalized on film and audio forever, this goes on the internet and it's there forever, and many thousands of people listen to it, uh, do step up and we'll be happy to take a question. You can ask any of us anything. You can ask me why I do this, et cetera. Or you can wait till afterwards. So I want to start with Philip. And first I want to ask you, where are you from? Where, where, before you were a graduate student, what were you doing? Uh, I'm originally from Wisconsin, so okay. a small town in northern Wisconsin. And before I was a graduate student here, I was an undergrad at University of Wisconsin-Madison. Okay. And that's where I started to get interested in virology. Did you do research there? I worked in, originally I worked with potatoes at the USDA and got interested in pathogenesis. And then from there I moved to Tom German's lab, okay. who studies plant viruses. All right. So then you got interested in virology and decided to go to graduate school. Yep. And to and make the commitment that this would be my life. So, and you're G5, which means you're almost done? Maybe. Depends who you ask. <laughs> Sean's not here. That's true. That's true. My boss isn't here, so yeah. I'm you close. can say whatever you want. <laughs> it's fine. No problem. So why don't you tell the listeners what a retreat is? Because I'm, I'm sure a lot of them know, but uh, perhaps many of them don't. What's a science retreat? Uh, well, what's nice about the Harvard Virology Retreat is the students organize it. So it's a chance for us to get to know each other and to get to know the faculty 
but it's also a chance for us to you know, pick and choose what aspects we want to hear that year, how we want to arrange the treat. So the, the class below us that has arranged this retreat has done a nice job picking a new venue and a new keynote, obviously. So each year has a different flavor that the class brings to the project. So normally there's a keynote speaker. Who, so can you remember one of the past keynote speakers, just out of curiosity? Uh, so last year, my class organized the retreat, and we had Susan Lindquist talk. Okay, wonderful. So she gave a talk about chaperones and prions and evolution of folding and its effects for evolution of okay. cell biology. So usually it's much more... Uh, traditional? Yeah, much more traditional yeah. than this year. Yeah, so you have a person speaking this year. I think this is very creative, an idea to have a podcast as a keynote, not a single person. Uh, because I th and I think this is uh, really part of the future of uh, virology and science communication to do this kind of thing. And um, so it's, it's pretty neat that you guys uh, decided to do this. Uh, so at this retreat, what happens? Do people just drink a lot? <laughs> we get to know each other. So, <laughs> so not that sense. <laughs> Well, we're five minutes to do it, and already we're going to We'll, we'll no. take care of it in post. <laughs> you get to know each other, so people give talks, right? So the professors and students both give talks, and then there's time for poster sessions where you can, can meet the other people, and meet especially the new students to meet new faculty members or to meet the rest of the faculty. Right. So I think as a first-year student, it's an important time to start picking your lab and start picking which areas you want to go into. So you have talks, there's posters, and then there's socializing where you get to know each other. Right. Well, so. so we also have a retreat. What I think is nice about this is that it's a thematic retreat. It's virology. Many of them are departmental based, and they're very mixed. So actually, right now, I'm missing my department's retreat to be here. <laughs> but I don't mind because it's a, it's a mixed bag, and there's, there are only two virologists left at Columbia. So I'm really happy to be here in a crowd of virologists. And we do have a big crowd here, I should say. There are it looks like 100 people, right? OK, that's a good number. It places full. There are people standing in the back. And uh, <laughs> they're all virologists, which uh, nothing could be cooler. All right, so that's a retreat. And we are here. And uh, I think this is a big honor for TWIV to be able to do this. So Philip, you're a fifth year graduate student. What, what do you do? Whose lab do you work in? And what do you do? I work in Sean Whelan's lab. And we study negative strand RNA viruses. And one of the main focuses of the lab is understanding how the replication proteins are able to work with a specially encapsulated genome and special enzymatic functions in order to make messenger RNAs and to drive gene expression. Mm -hmm. Someone once asked us on TWIV, why aren't all RNA viruses positive stranded? It's so much easier to do everything. I, th I mean, I've asked the same question to my boss as well. And I guess the, maybe the answer that I've come to reconcile with is that What's unique about the negative strand viruses is that they encapsulate their genome in a protein sheath. Mm -hmm. And so this protects it from degradation and protects it from recognition by cellular immune defenses. And so it's hard to say which came first, but maybe once you evolve to protect your genome in a protein sheath, then it's easier to evolve copying that into sure. positive messenger sure. RNAs. Well, polio came first, and then everything else followed. <laughs> in, in importance, at least. Yes, of course. Well, it just shows that there is, my answer was there wasn't, there's no fitness cost or no obvious fitness cost for being negative stranded. Right, or maybe there's the fitness right. gain of having these yeah. advantages. Otherwise, it would be gone. Gene. So what exactly do you do in the lab? What's your project? So I'm interested in the actual polymerase of the replicator protein. So most negative strand RNA viruses have a single protein that contains all the enzymatic functions and it's very generically known as L, or the large protein. And so we are able to purify recombinant forms of this protein so we can look outside of cells and look just in, in the glass beaker, basically, activities of this protein. And so we can analyze mutants and phenotypes that we couldn't otherwise characterize in a live virus. So we're set up to do biochemistry and structural biology to understand how the viral enzymes are able to accomplish what usually takes a suite of cellular enzymes to do. So what will you be famous for as a graduate student? TWIF. <laughs> <laughs> well trained, good guy. Um, I think the, the most important thing that we've put forth so far is before we started, the large protein was essentially a black box. We had no structure information. And so our end goal is atomic resolution, but the main achievement we've made so far is using 
single particle electron microscopy in collaboration with the Waltz lab to get the initial idea of the overall architecture of these enzymes. So my work that I've done with the viruses and then the work of a very talented postdoc in our lab, Amal Vermeer, working with um, vesicular somatitis virus, a mononegative virus, or a non-segmented negative strand RNA virus. We've shown what the basic overall architecture of these large polymerase proteins mm -hmm. and how they relate to each other. So what, what do you need to do to finish and, and move on? Uh, what, we've just basically tipped the iceberg of what we can do outside the cell with our counter protein. So we've shown a general idea of the structure and a general idea of the activity, but what we'd like to do is start bringing in some of the other viral proteins that we know are important for these reactions. And so demonstrate that we can actually recapitulate most of RNA synthesis outside of the cell. So that's what we're hoping to achieve before the end of my thesis. So what's next for you after you finish? You're going to continue in virology? Uh, I'm definitely going to continue in silence. And I'm, I think that I'd like to work more at the interface of virology and cellular biology. Mm -hmm. But I'm, I've been I mean, I'm most excited about the structural biology work we've done so far. So I want to go into crystallography and structural biology work. So yeah. I'm looking for postdocs. Have you, you have some thoughts about uh, what you want to do? Uh, I'm particularly interested in the RNAi machinery right now, or like the RISC complex or the CRISPR complexes. So right. the cellular RNA enzymes that are controlling viral infection and controlling cellular gene expression as well. So would you move to a prokaryotic system? Because you mentioned CRISPR. Sure. Yeah. Yeah. So I think I'm interested. I'm interested in the fundamental enzymes themselves and not so much the organism they're yeah. related to. So I think getting used to virology or getting used to you know, many different simplified organisms or model systems and how much you can learn from these as well. Anybody have any questions for Philip before we move on? I, uh, you mentioned before some work you were interested in doing in Africa. Do you want to talk about that? Um, it's largely work we do as a collaboration. So you don't want to talk about it. Okay. I'll leave that for the, the main proponents of that work to speak Okay. <laughs> All right, before we uh, move on to David, I uh, just want to mention that this episode of TWIV is brought to you by, <laughs> wait for you to laugh, is brought to you by Wiley Blackwell, the leading scientific publisher of books, scholarly journals, major reference works, and databases. This month, that's October, is this October? No, September, excuse me. They are offering 25% off of all microbiology and virology books. To take advantage of this offer, go to wiley.com slash go slash microbe world, okay? wiley.com slash go slash microbe world, and you can see their catalog of microbiology and virology textbooks, and they have a whole page, Studies in Viral Ecology is one of them, if uh, microbial ecology, if you like bacteria, they have Bacillus anthracis and anthrax, so a nice collection of books, and you can save some money. And of course, we thank them for their support uh, of this week in virology. If you're a Facebook user, they have a fan page. It's facebook.com slash microbiology news. Anything else you'd like to say? Thank you for having me, and thank you for the students for reminding me of the Feel free to uh, interject in the rest of the conversation, of course, and think about <laughs> your pick of the week. I guess I have the most time to think about it. You do have a lot of time. <laughs> we will do some emails as well, so you have an opportunity to answer some of those. You might be interested in them. So, David, I've known you for many years. What's, yes. our, what's the thread that connects us? Virology study section uh, first. Yeah. First, right. But we were both in David Baltimore's lab. Right, exactly. But you were, you were there before, long I, before I was. I was a student. <laughs> <laughs> long before you were. You're G, what, 75? Um, no, not that old. <laughs> no. I don't want to count. I used to see you at David's Summer Woods Hole uh, picnics. We did. We did go after used to I come to those. Right. When I came back to Harvard, when I came to, back to Boston at Harvard, you were a postdoc. Right. With David then. And so you were. Yeah, was I was starting here. I was starting, starting at Harvard as an assistant professor okay. in '79. So you you were a postdoc with David. I was student. a student with David and postdoc, postdoc with, with Bernard, Bernard Roy Smith. Okay. So I have to ask. So when you were in the lab, there were no shelves. Because yesterday during his talk, was, he, he said he built the shelves in the David. That was Peter Palazzi. That was Peter Palazzi's. Peter Palazzi. Oh, yeah. Okay. Uh, so there were shelves for David Baltimore. There were shelves in David Baltimore's lab. <laughs> yeah, I had to wait to get a bench in David Baltimore's lab. But. Yeah, David. There were shelves. Peter's didn't have shelves, so we bought them. That was that's a very funny story. I like that. Um, so David, we, there are many things we could talk about um, that you do, but I thought I could have you talk about your efforts to make a vaccine against. 
herpes simplex virus type 2. So maybe we could start by having you describe what, what is the need for a type 2 vaccine. Well, um, herpes simplex virus uh, 2 causes genital herpes, and so there's a, there's a lot of disease that's caused by um, it, genital herpes, of course. It's a problem. It's a problem if babies get infected with, uh, genital, with genital herpes during, during delivery um, or if an individual is immunocompromised, it's also a problem. There's also the problem of, of course, of herpes simplex virus 1, usually um, spreading to the nervous system, causing encephalitis um, or infecting um, the cornea, um, which can cause blindness eventually. So you're, you're, you're doing both one and well, two? Well, the vaccine, the vaccine, you know, the market is primarily for a general herpes vaccine, but the, the vaccine candidate we have may protect against HSV-1 as well. But also, uh, genital herpes increases the risk of HIV infection by three to four fold in the epidemiological studies. So we hope that a general herpes vaccine by reducing uh, herpes infection can also re reduce HIV infection. So there's a need both to protect against um, herpetic disease as well as HIV disease. So what's the incidence infection. of, of type 2 infections? So uh, in, the, in the U.S., the, uh, the prevalence of HSV2 infection is about 17% now um, in the general population, but it's at least twice that in the African-American population, and it's highest in African-American women, which is, it can be 50 to 60%. Um, but in developing countries, uh, the prevalence of HSV2 can be 80 to 90 percent in, in some study populations. And, and like type 1, it's recurring, right? Like type 1. So both, both HSV1 and HSV2 establish a latent infection in sensory neurons from which they can react and cause recurrent disease, HSV1 causing the, the cold sores or fever blisters and HSV2 causing recurrent um, genital herpes. And so the, the, the increased HIV uh, incident is due to the lesions being more readily transmitting so the, the virus? Yes, yeah, the connection between uh, herpes and HIV infection uh, is probably several fold. Obviously, open lesions in the, in the genital tract can allow um, entry of HIV and infection, um, but also herpes infection brings in uh, CD4 cells, dendritic cells, which are the host cells. The, inf the inflammatory process brings in the host cells for HIV, which increases the likelihood of infection. But also the herpes um, inflammatory response will also activate CD4 T cells, which will um, increase the, uh, the host cell um, productivity for, for HIV infection. So, so, so uh, there's probably several factors that are right. involved. So what are the triggers for reactivation similar for, for types 2 and 1? Uh, stress, um, ultraviolet light exposure. I mean, it's, uh, it's yeah, many of the same uh, stresses will induce um, HSV-1 and HSV-2. So the, the idea then the vaccine would reduce the genital lesions and reduce HIV in, in countries where uh, it's a problem such as Africa, right? Um, yes, but I, yes. Now, so we do have antiviral, very effective antivirals against herpes simplex viruses, right? We, so have, we, have, we have effective antivirals against herpes, herpes simplex virus, uh, but there's still a need. Vaccines are still the best public health measure to, to induce protection against infection so that you don't have to take the drugs continuously. Um, and there's people that are still sensitive to these drugs. They're, some of them are, the very, are very safe, but people still don't like to take them constantly. So the idea is the, the vaccine would induce, so the vac, the, a herpes vaccine could be either a prophylactic or a preventive vaccine or a therapeutic vaccine. Uh, and so the idea is if you immunize people before they're exposed to herpes, you can induce protection that will prevent infection. Um, but with herpes, just like a varicella zoster virus, you could also think about vaccinating or immunizing therapeutically after they're already infected to in, in, increase immunity and reduce the recurrent infections. And so that's a, so there's a therapeutic vaccine. So, um, so in animal models, we have 
we found our vaccine candidate can be either a prophylactic, has prophylactic activity or therapeutic activity in, in, in different animal models. So aside from Africa, is there, are there any other areas where such a herpes vaccine would be beneficial? Well, I think there's, there's still a couple of thousand cases per year of, of babies that get infected during delivery. And even though we have, that's in the United States. And, um, and even though we have antivirals that are very good and they can be treated, there's still um, maybe 50% of those babies may still die. Um, and, and, certainly, and even the survivors will have neurological uh, problems um, as a result of the infection. So, I mean, there's, there's and there's, there's still the, the need to prevent the genital infection, which is you know, sort of a psychological issue for, um, for people, you know, having, having children and, and whatever. So it's a, it's a big, there's a big psychological uh, toll of, of herpes that. So this would be a vaccine that could be, if it worked and everything works out as we'll see, it's a vaccine that would, could be available globally, right? It could be, yes. And when would you envision it being given very early in life? Uh, so again, it's a, it's a vaccine for a sexually transmitted disease, just like the, the papillomavirus vaccine. So yes, it would be given to kids before they become sexually active. Right, okay. Uh, so let's talk a little bit about your vaccine candidate. I, I was reading about this very interesting strain. How did, how did you come about to develop that, that one. It's called DL5-29, is that right? Right, DL529. Uh, so, well, there's, there's a history. We, we, were, we didn't set out to make a vaccine. We were, we were constructing replication defective mutants to study gene function and cell culture. So it was basic virology. What's the, what's the function of these genes? You make a mutation, we made deletions in genes that, and, that were essential for replication. So then to grow the viruses, we grow them in a complementing cell line. And we had made a series of these just to do basic studies. And we, um, we were collaborating with Bob Finberg, at, who was then at the Dana-Farber Cancer Institute. Uh, he was doing some immunological studies and he wanted to look at what aspects of viral replication were needed uh, for inducing um, a certain kind of immune response or a change um, in the immune response. And so um, we gave him these, we gave him the, some mutant viruses and they, um, they induced the, the uh, um, antibody response that he wanted, but they also, they induced a strong um, anti-herpes antibody response, um, which sort of went, went against the dogma at the time, which said that you needed viral replication or large amounts of a sub, of protein subunits to induce immune response. So it argued this, so it suggested this replication defective virus, which wouldn't spread and cause disease, would be a safe vaccine candidate. So we, we spent the last 20 years uh, working on this, trying to, developing strains. So we, we, made, it, we made mutations in, in HS, HSV2 for a general vaccine. We deleted two genes called UL5 and UL29, so the virus is called DL529. So it was two mutations to make it safe. And um, so these are two essential genes they're for both, replication. They're both essential for DNA replication. So they, they independently render the virus replication defective. So it's, it's totally dead in normal cells, or at least it will go in and express um, a, a number, a large number of viral gene products, but not form infectious virus. So it can't spread onto new cells. It can't spread to the nervous system. And what it does express is sufficient to induce immunity. It induces. We'll, which we'll talk about. Um, but you have to propagate this vaccine in a complementing cell line. That's right. Right? So is that, uh, in terms of production, uh, pharmaceutical production, is that a feasible thing to do? Uh, the, we've licensed this to Sanofi Pasteur. Um, we, meaning Harvard, has licensed it to Sanofi Pasteur. And they've, they've been working on this. Production of large amounts of, of HSV2 has been a limiting factor, but they, I, they seem to have um, figured, worked out how to produce large amounts of it and purify it uh, so that it is an acceptable uh, clinical product. And so, is this a cell line that you you produce that expresses the? We made we made a 
a Vero cell line, an uh, African green monkey kidney cell line. We made a cell line that complemented, but of course for making a clinical product, they wanted to go back and make this, reconstruct the cell line under good manufacturing um, procedure conditions so or GMP what, uh, procedures. What cell line did they use to reconstruct it? They used Vero's, but they went back and got a very early passage of Vero's that had not been exposed to any serum that might have um, BSC agent in it. Right, so they right, went back right, and right. got a very old, one of the original uh, Vero cell lines. And that can, a vaccine produced in that cell line can be licensed for use in humans? Yes, Vero cells have been used to produce vaccines, so. Hopefully they looked for other viruses, adventitious uh, viruses yes, that's, as well. That also, that's also part of the, the clinical um, development that they look for adventitious agents. But you know, Vero cells are good because they don't have endogenous retroviruses, I'm told. But. So how do you test this uh, vaccine? How do you do preclinical studies before you go into people? So we have, we have tested it by immunizing mice and then and then, we, and then we challenge the immunized mice with an, an intravaginal infection with wild type um, HSV2, another strain, and look at the ability of the vac vaccination to prevent um, disease and neurological um, disease. So what's the General outcome? disease and neurological disease. So when you infect mice by this route, you get ulceration? Yes, you get ulceration, you get spread of the virus to the central nervous system and encephalitis. And this happens in all mice inoculated or fractional? Different, oh, in, well, we, we give, we give uh, in this animal model, we give a large amount of virus so that we get all, all animals infected. Okay. And they all get the disease. So then you, you how, how do you inoculate uh, the animals with the vaccine? IP or some other route? Um, we either put it under the skin, subcutaneous, um, or now we're doing intramuscular, which is sort of the standard um, way that, cl that cl vaccines are given clinically. So that's... And then you challenge the mice and you look at the symptoms. We, look at, we looked at symptoms. We look at virus replication in the genital tract. And... So what, what does the vaccine do? So, the vac so immunization will reduce virus shedding, virus shed replication in the genital tract. Um, and under some conditions, we can get it, we can prevent all replication, um, and we, we can prevent disease. I mean, it's always better, easier to, and what vaccines you're usually um, used for is to prevent disease. And they don't necessarily prevent all infection, but they prevent disease. So we can, pr we can prevent disease, and we can rep re reduce replication to very low levels. Okay, and um, this is using I'm looking at a paper you just published which suggests that the strains in Africa are more virulent. So what, what's yes, that Yes, so story? our initial tests were with strains from, from the United States. Uh, but when we went to test, so we wanted to know whether it's strains from sub-Saharan Africa where there is this co-epidemic of HSV2 and HIV, whether the vaccine could pr protect against the strains from Africa. And the vaccine can 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 induce partial protection against it, and, or it can it can do pretty good. But it takes large amounts of the vaccine that we currently have to protect against the African strains. Um, so, but if we made the if we made a vaccine strain in the African background, it was better against the African viruses. So it suggests that there's some immunological epitope differences that um, for which it might be better to have an African strain as the genetic background for, for a vaccine to go to Africa. That's perfectly feasible, right? To make so a, that's feasible, yeah. and we're, we're working on that. But Do you know what are the viral epitopes that are protective? We don't know. I mean, we don't know what the epitopes are that are, protected, um, are protective. We'd even, we don't even know the, really the correlates of, of protection uh, because there are a number of vaccines, well, several vaccines have been tested in humans for herpes, uh, none of them have been successful, and so we don't really know what the, the corals of, of protection are or what the epitopes are. But the vaccines that have been tested have been largely subunit vaccines, glycoprotein subunit vaccines, which have not induced um, good CD8-positive cytotoxic T lymphocyte responses. 
So that's something that um, we think that our, our vaccine can do as well as induce antibody responses. But no, we don't know what epitopes are really important. These viruses do not um, enter DNA synthesis phase, right? They do not. They do not replicate DNA. So, are there right. are there proteins made after exclusively after DNA synthesis that you can eliminate from being needed for protection? Then, um, at least in the mouse model, well, there's there are some very late proteins that um, are not expressed or expressed at very low levels by the mutant virus, and so those don't seem to be important in the mice. And we'll have to see whether. Um, they're, whether they're successful in humans or not. But. So what do you need to do next to go into to a phase one trial, say? So, the, so this, is, this is with, as I said, Sanofi Pasteur right now. They are working on producing it. They're just doing the, the toxicology studies with the, with the product that they're, that they're making, and so then it'll be ready to go into people. So that's all. So the mouse is sufficient preclinical and toxicology, and then you can do a phase one. I think that there's, I think there's enough need. Yes, probably this, the safety studies. Pro, I, I, don't, I can't speak for the FDA, but probably safety studies in, in, in mice, rabbits, whatever, um, will be sufficient. It's possible that they will re require some primate, some primate studies. But um, I, th I, from sort of, from some of the informal conversations I've had with, with people, I think that probably the the mouse and the guinea pig and then the rabbit, the rabbit safe, some rabbit or other small animal stu safety studies will be, will be fine. Right. So this could actually go quite far forward in <coughs> clinical trials. It's probably pretty exciting to think it's, that you could develop a, a vaccine, right? Right. It's exciting to see that, you know, something come out of, mm -hmm. of our basic science research. And, and, the, and the point that. that's important to make is that it was accidental because you weren't starting to make a vaccine. You were just it, doing basic it was, science. It was, it was accidental. And it was investigator-initiated research, <laughs> R01-funded <laughs> research. That's right. Yeah, That's it wasn't someone said, you have to work on this and solve this problem. This is the best kind of science there is when you let scientists just do what they're interested in. I'll get off my soapbox. <laughs> yeah, Preaching to the this, choir, I <laughs> think. Yes, I know, but many more people than in this room will listen right. to us, of course. Many, many poor, and, and uh, many of them will disagree with us. We had a, a, a letter from a listener a long time ago who said, you're always complaining about funding, but it seems to me there's plenty of money for you guys to do your work. And you see, people just don't understand. What, so we have to keep going at it. You have to repeat over and over. One thing Peter Palazzi taught me is that it never hurts to say things many times, especially when you're teaching medical students. <laughs> you just repeat it over. Sorry, I don't mean to offend any medical students. Especially <laughs> repeating things over and over <laughs> again is, is very good. Um, let's, let's go over to Priscilla, who's been patiently awaiting saying something here. And there's so many things we could talk to you about. But first, tell us um, a little bit about your background. Where have you Scientific from? background, a personal background. I am f originally from a small town in Arkansas called Pine Bluff. And <laughs> <laughs> Phil, it was relevant. Phil said he was yeah, a small town from, good. and that's why I used the word cobbler earlier. So you grew up in Arkansas? I grew up in Arkansas, wasn't interested in science at all, went to liberal arts, f to liberal arts college. I went to Yale College for undergraduate, and because of having to take distributional requirements, took chemistry and it kicked my butt and because <laughs> that, that challenge was interesting to me, I thought I'm going to take organic and I loved organic chemistry and because I was work study and you could earn more money doing a lab job than being a library monitor, I took work study in a laboratory and was really nurtured by the graduate students and postdocs there and became interested in it and loved my science classes and lo and behold I became a science major and then went to UC Berkeley and earned my PhD in bioorganic chemistry, but had a fundamental interest and curiosity about viruses, and so decided for my postdoctoral work to, to try to become a virologist. And of course, I picked hepatitis B virus and hepatitis C virus, for, for which at the time there were no infection models. So all of the things that virologists normally do, I could not learn to do, <laughs> but I still learned a lot. And then when I became faculty, um, here, I, I moved to working, I continued working with Hep B and Hep C, but I started working with dengue virus. 
So you never know where virologists are going to come from. No. It's a lot of serendipity in science. Yeah, it it's is. really good. But uh, chemistry does get you excited about many different fields. It it's does. Great, it's just a great science. So one of the things I wanted to ask you about is your work on what you call lipidomics mm -hmm. of viral infection, because we are, we are as working with picornaviruses, we're familiar with the need to make lipids during infection. So what, what are you trying to do with that? Well, it's, so this started off even when I was a postdoc and reading classic papers, reading Fields Virology, and seeing these very beautiful electron micrographs where you see very morphologically distinct membrane structures. And I can remember asking the postdocs who are real virologists, <laughs> what are those made out of? Why are they morphologically distinct? Is it because of the proteins that are in the membranes, or is the lipid content different, what's in the membranes? And sort of being told, we don't exactly know, we don't know. And I thought, that's, a, that's really a chemical question. What, what, is the, what, what molecules are in those, in those lipids? And at the time, there wasn't, or I didn't really know of a way to address that. And with you know, tremendous advances in analytical chemistry, um, primarily mass spectros sp spectrometry, um, it, it has become possible to analyze very complex lipid mixtures and, and with a lot of um, selectivity and specificity and, and distinguish between very similar lipids the way a chemist would want to do. So how do you, in practice, how do you do that in a virus infected cell? Um, in practice, well, very crudely, what we started off doing was taking cells that had virus. We started off with hepatitis B virus and cells that were not replicating hepatitis B virus. And we do a total organic extraction into chloroform methanol. And then we take that entire mixture and we inject it on a liquid chromatography column. And as things come off the column, based on their hydrophobicity, things more, more polar come off first and, as, and things that are more hydrophobic stay in the column longer. But as they come off the column, they go directly into a mass spectrometer. And you me they, 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 they are ionized and you measure the mass to charge ratio and, and you collect data, but on many, many, on many, many lipids. We monitor routinely you know, 10,000 lip 10, lipid ions in an experiment. So this tells you the total lipid change in a cell. Well, you, right? you try to, t for us, we were doing steady state measurements. So we're asking, is the steady state abundance of any of these lipids that we can detect changing in the presence of the virus? And I think it's important to emphasize that you know, we say lipidomics, which sort of implies global, global monitoring of this. But depending on your chromatography conditions and how you did your extraction and the sensitivity of your instrument, you, it's impossible to see everything you see as much as you're able to see. So you, do you fractionate the cells at all, or you just do total cells? We, we start off just doing total, total cells. cells. Yeah. Because one, in, one interesting approach would be to purify vesicles. And no, purify, and exactly. Right? And I, I mean, we started off just doing total, total, total lipid extracts. And now, as there are specific lipid metabolites that we're interested in, then we go back and we start trying to, trying to isolate, biochemically isolate you know, viral particles versus membranes of interest. So what, do you find any interesting differences? For hepatitis B virus, it's interesting. There was one metabolite in particular, which is a penultimate intermediate in cholesterol biosynthesis called 7-dehydrocholesterol, so cholesterol with one extra double bond. And that accumulates at steady state to around tenfold more greater abundance than it, than it is uh, present in, uh, in cells that don't have hepatitis B virus replicating in them. So yeah. what, what do you do with that information next? What do, you do, what do you do with that information next? We started asking fundamentally, like doing what you suggested, which is like purifying. Well, we purified viral particles, and we discovered they're incorporated in the viral particle. And so you start to ask then, is that important for the trafficking of that particle? Does it reflect something of how the hepatitis B virus is, is trafficking out of the cell? Or does it have to do with the next infection cycle and the, and the ability of the virion to enter into the next cell, which is for Hep B is actually quite difficult to try to address experimentally since we don't have a cell culture infection model. But that's sort of the general direction we, we try to go so in. So how do you modify lipids in cells? I mean, we can do proteins really easily with small RNAs, but what about lipids? So ideally, you have a small molecule inhibitor of the enzyme that produces it. And this is a good example where and for 7-dehydrocholesterol, the enzyme that directly produces it is lithosterol oxidase. And there's not really a great small molecule inhibitor of that, so we had to turn to RNAi and, and fooling around with depleting, trying to deplete the cell of the enzyme. But then you have to go back and, and use your analytical chemistry again to, to verify that the metabolite is actually gone. 
Um, and so we did that experiment, and we see when we, when we do that experiment that the abundance, a steady state abundance of HPV pregenomic RNA goes down, and when we check in the culture supernatant, the number of gen genome-containing particles making the other cell goes down, but that experiment tells us that the protein is important. We don't know that the protein is important because of the protein and the, the accumulation of the metabolite is just a, a byproduct or if it's the metabolite itself. To determine that, you really need to add back the metabolite and show that the addition of metabolite rescues and, and then you know. And so we, we, we get into things like that. So for any lipid you discover a difference, you can usually um, pinpoint the pathway that produces no, it? No, well, that's the thing. You hope you can, and there, that's some serendipity. Certainly, in some of the profiling that we've done, there are a lot of ions that are changing significantly, and despite having uh, a predicted molecular formula, if you plug that into lipid maps, it doesn't match up with anything that's canonical. And I think, in a way, those are the most interesting things to try to characterize, although chemically, those are the, those yeah, are the biggest challenges. Sure, sure. So Hep C also induces massive lipid changes, yes. right? Have you done anything with that? We've done we we we've, we've done similar profiling with that, and there we see perturbations also in sterile biosynthesis. And in that case, we have been able there there are small molecule inhibitors of the enzyme that produce um, desmosterol, which is the metabolite that's upregulated. And in that case, we've done the rescue experiment, and when you add, and the virus is rescued by the addition of the metabolite. And so we're trying again to figure out why is this metabolite important for the virus. So this, this work clearly has fundamental implications about how viruses replicate. Are there any practical outcomes? Can you see it being useful for, say, antiviral approaches at some point? Um, potentially, potentially. And I think especially now with the interest in host targets for antivirals, certainly mm -hmm. a lot of yeah. the enzymes yeah. that we're identifying fall into those categories. But um, it's not driving the work, right? No, no, it really was this, I'm looking at pictures and I'm very curious about what does this mean and then wanting to go after it. When you write your grant, you have to say why this is relevant and you have to put some health-related right. sentence, right? Right, right. So we all have to do that, absolutely. <laughs> Are there any questions for either uh, David or Priscilla before we go on to other things? I wanted to, uh, yes, yes, Ron, G. Uh, Shout wanted, it out. You have to come up, to have to come up in mic. front of the camera. Take, <laughs> uh, take the mic so you get recorded for posterity. Just don't trip over the wires. They can see your Cheshire cat grin. <laughs> can I use a false identity? Now, no. I, I have a question for Priscilla. Not on. Can you, so if. Sorry, flip the switch. Yeah, it's not on. It's way too complex. It's on the side. <laughs> Someone help Ron. Did someone help? Uh, Can one of the students help Ron? Thank you. Is the show? Yeah. Okay, this is, this is Ron DeRosa. <laughs> I, I have a question for Priscilla. So if one, uh, so if one is studying a viral encoded envelope protein that's, that's in the envelope and, and you do a standard uh, cell glycate. Mm -hmm. Hold on. Sorry. Yeah. Okay. And, and, and then you make a standard cell lysate and immunoprecipitate that envelope protein. Mm -hmm. um, uh, can one assume that there will be probably some membrane fragments associated with that immunoprecipitated envelope protein? And then might that be a way of, of looking what, and if there are, might that be a way of looking at the specific lipid composition in the vicinity of the membrane-spanning domain of that envelope protein? Um, I think potentially, but I think uh, the devil's in the details. I mean, because a lot of the extraction buffers or solvents that you use are going to remove or break up that, potentially break up that association. But I think potentially, yes, like, one could do that. Would that be useful for, for your studies? Definitely it would. Definitely would. Thank you. Anybody else? Thank you, Ron. Ron DeRosier of Harvard Medical School, New England Primate Center. I had and, a question for Priscilla. Yeah. I was wondering, do you, can you get a sense of how the lipid composition between uh, virions changes virion-to-virion -virion basis? 
I mean, it's a population experiment measuring. Yeah, that, but... I know, and we have we don't we don't have the sensitivity that we would need to do to do that. I think. I was thinking of like the really high particle to PFU ratio for a lot of these viruses mm -hmm. and whether lipid composition is affecting this and entry. I think certainly it's well. interesting um, to do, and and certainly it, it's theoretically possible that we purify, we, we identify, we find some way to fractionate the ones that have high specific infectivity from those that have low, and do the characterization characterization that way. We have not performed so how, things like that before. How many variants do you need? to see a signal on the liquid mass spectrometry? I don't know. Uh, how many virions? I don't know. We can detect picomoles. <laughs> and so if you give me a, if you give me, if you give me a calculator or, 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 or some paper to do this, but, you know, but the, many the calculation, more than one. yeah, but many more than, it, it's a non-trivial experiment for us. Maybe, especially with the viruses we work with. If we went to something like VSV that is a more robust replicator, it might become a bit more, a, a bit more um, tractable of a problem. Okay, so one of, the, one of the other things I wanted to do today is just talk a little bit about what we do here. Um, so as you know, we do this weekly podcast to help the public understand science a little better. And it's not just telling them the facts about stories and virology. It's also them listening to virologists have conversations or just scientists in general. It's, it's, it's less obvious here, but in our normal weekly sessions, we have a few people talking with each other, and we wander off on tangents and talk about whatever we want, and people really enjoy that. They say we not only learn science, but we see how scientists are, because very few people see us, right? <laughs> <laughs> on a day-to-day -day basis, most of the time we're hidden, and they only see the papers that uh, make the news. So that's a, an important component of that. So what we're doing is, is communicating science to the public. And I just wanted to briefly ask all of you, uh, one at a time, have you ever done any science communication to either other scientists or the general public? And if so, uh, what have you done? Let's start with you, Philip. Um, I guess so far in my career, I've had the most experience are going to meetings and communicating with other sciences or scientists. Right. But uh, one of the areas that I I guess it's important to me, and going back to the public, is um, things like writing, writing letters to my school board back from my hometown of the opportunities I had and how they shaped my career and my interest in science. And especially talking with other students in the program and the opportunities they had or professors that they had. You can see you know, having these things at an early on helps you understand what's going on and help you get into this lifestyle as well. So I think that's important in general. Yeah, absolutely. How about you, David? Um, certainly not in the scope that, that, that you do, but I, I do have, I have, a, I have a sort of high school lecture that I've given to uh, a number of high school classes that's in, it's entitled Viruses, Epidemics, and Vaccines or something. But the idea is to convey to them sort of what we do, as you say, that we, that we, we have our own ideas about hypotheses and ideas about how things work and that we design experiments to do it and that we get that we have fun doing it thinking about what we're what we're thinking about our ideas and then how we can prove them and that we get to think about what we want to think about and um, to the extent that we have money to run our grants our, our labs to do that but um, but then but it, but in the terms of but I also sort of have some slides of locations in Africa and Japan and wherever that we have meetings and sort of some of the fun, some of the fun aspects of it. So try, it's, it's to try to get them an idea as to what scientists do, as you say. Um, also, the, the herpes vaccine has become a public education effort because I get emails very frequently and the lab gets phone calls, but people wanting um, people wanting the vaccine, people wanting to participate in it, people wanting the vaccine for their kids. Um, so this is a public education, uh, it's become a, an education effort in terms of, and everything that you write to them then gets posted on the, on the web, and so. Uh, yeah, it's a new world. Yeah, it's a new world. How about you, Priscilla? Mm. I embarrassingly do very little. <laughs> I, I, I like Phil and like, and like David and like all of us go to scientific meetings. Uh, and primarily talk to my colleagues and other scientists. In terms of talking to lay people, 
I do periodically or have periodically given talks at lunchtime you know, to, to colleagues at the university who are non-scientists and explaining what we do and what we're interested in and, and how we go about our work. And also, um, I guess the other group of people are, are donors and benefactors who are not necessarily scientists but, but clearly care about what we're doing and, and it's always nice and, and, and rewarding to communicate with them about what we're doing. There are many ways that we can do this. We don't all have to do podcasts, we can do smaller things, but I think each of us should do something. And uh, throughout your careers as they develop, just remember that it's really important to talk to the public and you have to do it over and over. You can't do it once and assume that everyone understands what you're saying. You have to repeat it. What can we talk about? What are, what are the good venues for people who feel like they don't do it very much to become involved in that sort of communication? Well, there's a wonderful activity here that goes on mm -hmm. that I learned about and uh, it involves going to a local right. bar and talking to people <laughs> on, what is that called? You want to explain it to us? Grab a mic. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> so what's your name? So my name's Jeff Tyler. I'm a fourth year student okay. here. Um, so the program that you're referring to is called Science by the Pint. It's run by Harvard <laughs> Science and the News, a uh, graduate student organization whose goal is to make science more accessible to the public. And Science by the Pint is one of the ways we do it. Uh, basically what we do is we bring in a faculty member from around Boston or even from far away it's around the University of Providence. Uh, they bring a couple of their postdocs, they give about a five minute talk in a bar that we have this at regular intervals at. And following that, they and their postdocs just mingle with the people at the bar. They bring whiteboards and they can talk about anything from what research do you do, what, how did you get interested into it, and then they can give you questions like, well, how did you get into science? What's it like? What is, how did you get interested in the question you're asking now? Um, but we do that, there's a number of other ways. A lot of them focus on sort of graduate students learning how to do science communication mm -hmm. first. Um, it's more of a grad student organization. So uh, this happens in many cities. It happens in New York. Columbia does a science cafe on Broadway, which is very similar. Uh, I know they happen in Washington as well. So that's another way you can do it. You can write, you could write things on the web if you want. I have a blog I also do, which 2,000 people look at every day, so it makes a big impact. Um, and there, there are many, many ways that you can do this. Um, anybody do anything else that, that we should mention? But there, search it out, yes. Pass the mic up. Pass the mic. Hi, um, I'm Kendra Lee. I'm also a foreign year student. Uh, so there are shelters around Boston that have educational opportunities. Um, so for example, I work volunteer at Rosie's Place and they have a whole educational center and um, they actually teach GED science there. Uh, so that's one way you can do it. You can volunteer at a shelter um, to do sort of these, these educational things. And you, it's really, really exciting because these women have never really been exposed to science before and you get to kind of open their eyes to a whole new world and they really love it so yeah thank you uh, I've I've gone to my kids schools when they were yeah. in second or third grade yeah. that's great I, go, I went to high school and did a twiv actually there so you can do those sorts of things so even little things by all of you uh, it's really important because you're scientists and you have to spread the word so if you remember anything from today that is really important and of course being here and doing this is great and I've learned a lot of new names and I'll be contacting <laughs> you to come on TWIV so please don't say no uh, when I call you up. Uh, let's read a few email. We get 10 to 20 emails a week from listeners who ask questions or correct us sometime and here the first one is from Ed who is correcting us. He's, he writes, gentlemen I think you'll find that Dylan Thomas was Welsh, not Irish. <laughs> Though you are, of course, correct on his penchant for writing and drinking. So I think Dixon de Pommier last week said he was Irish. So Dixon apologizes for the error. <laughs> <laughs> All right, the next one is from Josh, who writes, I have one question and comment about your section on the Draco broad spectrum 
antiviral, which we covered a few weeks ago and which all of you must know having the work having been done at MIT. So this is, of course, a, a, a protein, a, a modular protein that binds RNA, activates apoptosis, and gets into cells all at once. And he writes, this might be a stupid question, but would not this antiviral interfere with the normal body microbe population by destroying unknown virus activity that we might need to live? This is a great question, right? I mean, not just um, eukaryotic viruses, but bacterial viruses. We have a tremendous gut microbiota, right, which is important for us, and the phages in those might be uh, attacked by this. Very interesting. But would Draco be able to get into a prokaryotic? That's a good question. Bacteria? I do not know. I think the tags, the, the it's a facilitators. Right? Yeah, so right. they probably, anyone know, are they specific for eukaryotic cells? They are. I think the effector, that the, the, the cytosolic effector is specific for eukaryotic cells. It would not be present yeah. in bacteria. Oh, yeah, there cells. wouldn't be the apoptotic right. machinery. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. So two levels. So it's a very good question, Josh. And this is Josh. I know is not a scientist, but these are you often get great questions from non-scientists who think of things in a different way. All right. So then he has a comment. So I had mentioned um, this work was done at Lincoln Labs, and I remember when I was a postdoc. This was in the um, late '70s. We didn't like Lincoln Labs because it's funded by the Defense Department, right? And there were lots of protests on campus about Lincoln Lab. So I talked about that. So he says, given your comment about the Lincoln Lab at MIT being involved with the Defense Department, wouldn't this be the antiviral compound you would come up with if you wanted to treat the victims of a bioterrorism attack? I mean, the problem of treatment timing doesn't fit a normal clinical situation because when they come in, they're probably on the downside of it. But it does fit a situation where you know that large numbers of people are exposed at the same time. If you suspected that you had been attacked that way, this antiviral would fit the bill. Of course, this assumes you know that you have been, are being attacked this way, but that's a different subject. What do you think? Am I off in space on this one? What do we think? All right, so you know Lincoln Labs is a federally funded research and development center that applies advanced technology to problems of national security. All right, and uh, I'll put a link to its website here. And, and bioterrorism is one of its uh, um, uh, points of attack. So it's possible, Josh. I think it's a good idea. Um, but I'm not sure that that work was being done in, in particular for that purpose. Yes. Can we pass the mic over to, to Kevin, please? So I think that's a, a great question. And um, one thing you guys brought up about the uh, therapeutic was that you may not get immune response to it after the first time you use it. Sure. So as a one and done after a bioterrorism attack, it probably would be ideal in that scenario rather than getting over the common yeah. cold, some uh, yeah. chronic infection. Does anyone have any particular insight into this? No. Okay. Anyway, Josh, thanks for the emails. Good points. Next one is from Alberto. Hi, Twivers. Here's a story from two years ago covering the release of mosquitoes in Queensland following on from your recent episode regarding control of dengue fever. It contains some great images of the release trial and the mosquito breeding cages. So he sends a link to some photographs of these mosquitoes, uh, how, the, how you release mosquitoes into the, uh, the wild, which was done very recently, as you know, the beginning of this year, uh, Wolbachia infected mosquitoes to control dengue. We talked about that, um, I think, last time as well. The next one is from Lance. Uh, Lance is a postdoc in the UK. He writes to us quite a bit. You've probably seen this already, and I've missed yesterday's TWIV, but the second item is really interesting, and it would be good to hear what you think about it. So this is a, he sent us a ProMed mail post, which is the isolation of a reassortant between uh, H3N2 and H1N1 influenza virus in a child in uh, Ontario, Canada, 16-month-old infant who was admitted to a Toronto hospital, um, they, they isolated reassortant virus from that child between the 2009 pandemic strain and H3N2, which both are co-circulating. So Lance wants to know, I have not heard about this happening much or even at all like this. My question is, why isn't this more common? Thanks for all the great work. So the ProMed mail post, which we'll put, is uh, very interesting. Uh, they go through the, uh, the isolation of this reassortant and they say it's the first case of reassortant involving pandemic H1N1 and seasonal 
H3N2. There was no evidence that it was transmitted to anyone who had contact with this child. So I, I think it probably happens frequently, but we never detect it. And, in, and we do have high surveillance now. We're looking at isolates uh, very carefully. So um, that's probably why we picked it up. H1N1 and H3N2 do tend to co-circulate still, although uh, H3N2 is at lower levels. So it's probably a low frequency event. And of course, you have to make a reassortment that's fit to be able to uh, replicate in the host. So that's what I think. Any, anyone have any insight uh, into that? Any flu gurus here? No? Anyone? That's my thought anyway. Give him the. Uh, sure, take the mic. Just have various segments have different intensities to reassort. Sorry. The segments have different intensities to reassort. Right. The segments uh, like to fit together, so that's not always what yeah. uh, happens with what lowers the frequency of what uh, of already rare event. Yeah, and in fact, this was. Um, let's see if I can find the constellation of this. I think it's only a matter of a few genes being reassorted. I can't find it offhand, right? Yeah. All right, our next one is from Ruth. And I, this is really for everyone to give Ruth some advice. I very much enjoy listening to TWIV and find your outlook on topical virology issues both refreshing and extremely interesting. Thank you so much for this. I am a university teacher in virology at the University of Glasgow, Scotland. Anyone here from there? No. We have recently received MRC funding for a new virology institute that is currently being built on our Garce Cube campus, and there is a wealth of exciting virology research going on in Glasgow. I am involved in virology undergraduate teaching here, and my students listen to your podcasts. I'm always on the lookout for novel teaching aids for virology and wonder if you can recommend any. We have your textbooks already. They're excellent. I appreciate that you are very busy. However, I hope you can recommend something new and fresh to me. Our students receive lectures and tutorials, and they read the literature and present virology topics in a number of formats, projects, dissertations, posters. I'm looking for some new ideas and have a small budget for this, 600 pounds, and I'm considering developing some good quality teaching software myself, pitched for senior undergraduates. Therefore, let me know if you can recommend any good teaching resources for virology. Um, so it's hard to come up with something new and fresh. Um, I think, a, I think a, uh, an app for an iPad or iPhone type thing would be great that um, gives you an overview of virology. I've always thought that would be good to have, but it's not been done. And so if you have some money and you can do some software development, that would be my suggestion. And something I'm thinking about is a simple uh, app that lists all the viruses and you can tap and get more information on each one. Basic stuff right in the app and then links out to um, more information. Anybody have any ideas for Ruth, what she could do? Welkin. <laughs> this is actually one that came up at my daughter's science fair. It's something we couldn't do when I was a kid. Is uh, You can take advantage of real data today when you're teaching. You can go online, use PubMed, you can teach kids how to blast sequences. Mm -hmm. So they could go into the influenza database and build some sort of project just around sequence analysis. But they're working with actual data that scientists yeah. produce. Yeah. I think that's good to, to teach them how to do that and let them go into the data. Thank you. That was Welkin Johnson, a two-timer on TWIV. Thanks for that. <laughs> All right, I'll read one more, and then we'll move on. And this is... Um, Another question, really good question, I'm going to open up to everyone. This is from Christina. She says, RNA viruses are the cause of so much human suffering. Most often we are presented with estimations of morbidity and mortality for individual viruses, but I've never seen a figure for RNA viruses or DNA viruses as a whole. Do you have an estimate? Well, it's a really good question. Any ideas? Probably you've never thought of that, have you? Broken it down. Um, so I, I did a little bit of research. My links are all broken here on my browser, unfortunately. Um, but there, one of the top viral causes of death is AIDS, right, HIV. And that's an RNA virus. I think also up there is measles. 
And of course, tuberculosis and malaria are also in the top 10. Um, so and there's rota rotaviruses. Rotaviruses, yeah, yeah, yeah. yes, diarrhea is a big one. But you could, I mean, the simplistic way is to go to the WHO websites and add up all of their, yeah. their different uh, yeah, so viruses. I do have a, um, a WHO website queued up here. So I'll post the, that link, and you could just add them up. But it, just by a cursory listing of the top diseases, it looks like RNA viruses uh, prevail. I guess we knew that already, right? Oh, <laughs> HIV is straddling the line, so. <laughs> it's not sure it wants to be, is yeah. what you're saying? Yeah. OK, well, uh, if any of our listeners have any advice, both for Ruth and for uh, Christina, you can write us a letter. We always love getting your questions and comments. You can send them to twiv at twiv.tv. Now it's time for our picks of the week. And you guys have had a lot of time to think about this. Science picks of the week. Philip, do you have one? Uh, I do. Uh, one of the things that I like about the new media is people writing in are giving data points. And so there's lots of, like the health map where you, I've seen is already one of your science picks where people are plotting points. But we're allowed to do non-virology ones as well, right? Of course. Anything science is good. So one example where I thought it was done really well is AntWeb. And this is run by a couple of entomologists um, here in America and other places. I, I can't remember the names. I it's think it's A N T W E B. Yeah, A N T W E B dot org, and it's David Fisher, I think, is his name. But what's nice is you pull up a map and it's three D of any ant species that they've added so far. Nice. And I mean, just gorgeous images of the ant rotating every every dimension, every way you want to go. And I thought. Is an example of where these different media presentations are going to go for viruses or, or diseases or pathogens nice. as well. And I think this is a particularly beautiful example of the technology. You can see some of the pictures. Yeah, it's beautiful. So it's fun yeah. just to surf through and see so different images. One, this is some ants. You can make big versions of this, yeah. but it's very nice. So if, if you're into ants or if you're just into seeing it you know, <laughs> done really well, it's, it's impressive. <laughs> but there's lots of things like these. So there's Jelly Watch. Or a time mo keeps track of, of octopus and jellyfish. Great. Setting, so, antweb.org. Thank you, Philip. It's perfect. Uh, David, do you have a pick for us? Um, well, I I was going to raise. I wanted to raise something novel in virology. And I was I was going to raise the the corals and herpes viruses. Uh, Forrest Rower uh, and his lab found in doing a meta genomics uh, study of coral uh, that. There's a lot of viral sequences, but there's also um, herpes-like DNA sequences that are found in coral, especially coral that's been stressed. And they even took coral and put it in the lab and stressed it with, with low pH, high temperature, and they found an increase in the herpes-like DNA sequences um, coming out as if, as if it was stress causing reactivation of, of herpes. And so that's, they published that, that's a few years ago. It was, it was 1998 in, in PNAS, um, but, there's, but there's plenty of non-primary uh, non reference uh, discussion of it. You can imagine how, how the web has gone wild with corals and herpes. But, um, but, the point, but, the, but even beyond this intriguing possibility that viruses are causing some of the, the disease in corals and the loss of our, our coral mass uh, in the oceans, it just it points out how much more we have to to find out about viruses and what you know diseases they're causing and their impact, uh, and so there's a lot to be done. And viruses like herpes simplex virus, it's probably in our brains as well as in our sensory ganglia, and can there's still a lot more that viruses are doing. And but this is a very intriguing biological system that corals and uh, corals and herpes. So if you're if you're scuba diving and you want to bring back some samples, uh, guys, we can, uh, we can do some PCRs for you. But don't illegally harvest coral. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Yes. So you, the uh, paper you sent is a PNAS paper. It's open access now. Um, metagenomic analysis indicates that stressors induce production of herpes-like viruses in the coral Pyrides compressa. So that's from Forrest Rower, who spends a lot of his time on boats sampling the ocean and looking for viruses. It's, sounds like a good job. You also sent a link to an article uh, on live science online, Herpes Virus Killing Coral Reefs. has a nice picture of this. And you know, whenever you bring up a web page, often there are Google ads on the right, right? 
So here it's herpes virus killing coral reefs. So the Google ads, tired of cold sores. 100% money back guarantee. It's immunea. And then red pine needle oil for all parasites, bacteria, viruses, and mold. We should send that to Lincoln Laboratory, see what they can do with it. Priscilla, do you want to uh, try a pick? Oh, so my pick is for all of the parents who have small children, and that are your local science museums. Boston has a really wonderful museum of science, and I was recently in North Carolina in Research Triangle area, and the Durham Life Sciences Museum is absolutely fabulous in terms of, I think I sent, I emailed a pic, and it had to do with some PBS programming that is also great, for pre, especially for preschoolers and science, but I think science is more about, should be more about doing necessarily than watching, and so I want to change my pics to the science museum. Very good. In the spirit of TWIV, changing mm. at the last minute, that's great. <laughs> we often do that. Yeah, I was just in Munich, and I went to the Deutsch Museum. To tech, science and technology it was fabulous. And actually, someone picked that on a TWIV a long time ago, and I went in August. Boy, what a great museum. So science museums can be really good, and I, I agree that, that people need to go. Unfortunately, in the in New York area, well, you know, the Museum of Natural History is wonderful, but over in New Jersey, there's the Liberty Science Museum, which is less than stellar, I'm sorry to say. <laughs> and there is an, there's an exhibit on HIV, and it's very wrong in many <laughs> aspects, one of them being that cells burst open and release new, released new virions. But I know two of the scientists who were consultants for this uh, um, exhibit, and they didn't get it right. So it's unfortunate, but... Anyway, thank you for that pick. All right, my pick is Contagion. <laughs> <laughs> Which opened now, I think, yesterday. And I haven't seen it. This is one of the picks I haven't seen. But I have to pick it because I've been thinking about it for a long time. This is, of course, a movie about a pandemic. Uh, my colleague at Columbia, Ian Lipkin, was the script <laughs> consultant. He had... Um, uh, Kate Winslet in the lab, and his technicians taught her how to pipette. He was, <laughs> taught her how to hold the pipette man properly. And um, so check it out. I want everyone, all listeners, go to see this movie. And um, we're going to do an entire TWIV on this at some point. We'll deconstruct it. I think that should be fun. But I found an interesting review, which I'll post the link to. It's on uh, E! Online. The grade for this movie, B-. minus. Forget Purell. Germaphobes will want to bathe in bleach and move into a bubble after watching this paranoia-inducing pandemic drama. Unnerving imagery in an A-list ensemble boosts the disease pick's potency, but Contagion isn't immune to the unfocused, overambitious story which diminishes its impact. So this is about a virus that an exec named Beth, played by Gwyneth Paltrow, picks up in a Hong Kong business trip. And apparently she dies early on in the movie. Her husband is played by Matt Damon who then goes on a uh, quest to try and stop this. The head of the CDC is played by Lawrence Fishburne. <laughs> and there is a cameo appearance by... <laughs> <laughs> cameo appearance by Gould, Elliot Gould. Mm -hmm. And he plays Ian Lipkin. So I don't know if any of you have ever seen Ian Lipkin, but he doesn't look like Elliot Gould. Anyway, it should be fun. Check it out, and we'll see how accurate it is. The, the thing is, this is a big deal. It's a big budget movie with a lot of stars. So a lot of people are going to see it, and I, I hope the science is at least close to right, because otherwise people will think that this is real virology, and that's not good. But, uh, so that's my pick, Contagion. We also have a listener pick of the week. Uh, this is from Jenny. She says, I've been a listener to TWIV for a while, and I can't tell you enough how much I enjoy listening. I'm a graduate student working on immune responses to influenza, and it's a wonderful addition to my education. I usually listen to TWIV while working in the hood or doing my runs or doing chores at home, allowing me to use my time wisely. Anyways, I came upon this review of a book by Carl Zimmer. Maybe you could feature it in your picks of the week. I haven't read it yet, but it looks to be an interesting read. Here's the link. And, it, and Carl Zimmer recently published a book on viruses called The World of Viruses. This is a review, actually, in PLOS Biology that she's sending in. It's by Michael Ammerman. And uh, you, you should read it, because it's, it's not kind. <laughs> Thanks so much for all the work you do. I enjoy the witty banter and the geeky punchlines, too. Who knew listening to a virology podcast can make you laugh out loud? 
more power. Thanks, Jenny, for that pick of the week. So TWIV, This Week in Virology, you can find us on iTunes and the Zoom Marketplace. You can find us at microbeworld.org. If you have an iPhone or an Android device, we have an app that you can use to stream the episodes to it. Go to microbeworld.org slash app, and you can find it there. You can always go to twiv.tv. We have the episodes playable or downloadable there. We have all the show notes. If you like Twiv, tell others, and that's one of the best things you can do is spread the word, get more people to listen to it. And if they like it, leave a comment on the, uh, the podcast page on iTunes, and that helps us stay at the top of the list so more people discover us. As I said, send us your questions and comments to twiv at twiv.tv, or go to our Facebook fan page, facebook.com slash This Week in Virology. I want to thank everybody for participating today. Philip, thank you so much. Hope you enjoyed it. Thank you for having me. Okay. David. Thanks. It's Thanks a fun. lot. It's been fun. And Priscilla. Thank you. So all of our guests today are in the virology program here at Harvard Medical School. I want to thank Kevin and Tim. Where's Tim? Thank you, Tim. Thanks for organizing TWIV. Thanks the audience for participating as well. Next week, TWIV will be broadcast live from ICAC in Chicago, Saturday, September 16th at 2 p.m. Central Time. I'll be there with Rich Condit. It will be video live stream with a chat room so people can ask questions. And of course, it'll be posted as usual uh, on the following Sunday. And I'm Vincent Racaniello. Of course, you can find me at virology.ws. You've been listening to This Week in Virology. Thanks for joining us. We'll be back next week. Another TWIV is viral. (laughs) 